Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. You guys, we're going to get started. There are empty seats scattered throughout here. If you have an empty seat next to you, can you raise your hand? Raise your hand if you have empty seats. All of you in the outside, if you can look at this. It's going to be a long time to stand. So I encourage you, we've got empty seats over here. Empty seats here. Are these empty seats back here? Over? That one's not empty. Are those empty seats behind you there? Looks like a couple. Some empty seats in the back. Any folks back there have empty seats next to you? There's still some hands up here, folks. They're coming your way. Keep your hand up till somebody's found it. It looks like this gentleman's looking for, are you looking for a space over here? Okay. All right, great. All right, so we're going to get started now, folks. Come here. Come here. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, good evening. My name's Ted Wheeler. I have the privilege of serving as your mayor. I'm here with my colleagues, Commissioner Udaley, Commissioner Fritz, Commissioner Saltzman uh, will be here. Commissioner Fish is here tonight. We want to welcome you all to our first community budget forum. I'm going to talk a little bit in a few minutes about some of the, the larger issues related to this budget process, but for right now, I wanna thank you for taking an interest in this process. I know people are very, very busy and have lots of commitments elsewhere, and so we all especially uh, respect the fact that you chose to be here tonight to help us with this budget process. So thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Sylvia Tuborowski, and I will be helping to facilitate the meeting today. So I'll just start by briefly going over the agenda and what you can expect today. So we'll start again with a brief presentation from the mayor, um, and then we will jump right into public testimony. So public testimony today is being taken by lottery. You should have received a ticket when you came in. If you would like to testify and you did not receive a ticket, 
please go back outside to the table out there to get um, a ticket. And the reason we're doing a lottery system is really to keep it fair. Um, there are a lot of people here and not everyone's going to have a chance to speak. So in order to um, allow as many people to speak as possible and not have this be first come first serve, we're using the lottery system. Um, for those of you who are not able to speak today, we do have comment forms and you can write down those comments and the commissioner uh, or the city council has committed to reading all of those comments and taking them into consideration. Today we also have some invited testimony from the community engagement liaisons and we'll be inviting them up throughout the evening. We also have interpretation available. We have ASL interpretation, Arabic interpretation, and Spanish interpretation. And I would just ask those interpreters to stand up and just tell, let, let us know what language. So she said that she's a Spanish. Here, here, here. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Soy la intérprete de español. ¿Hay alguien aquí con necesidad de interpretar solo en español? Por favor, alce la mano. مساء الخير انا مترجم عربي اذا حدا بيحب انا مترجم عربي اذا حدا بيحب مشان ترجم له عربي انا موجود هون and i am here tonight to provide sign language interpretation Okay, thank you. Um, and also, we don't plan to have any breaks today, so if you need a break, just step outside. Um, restrooms are located just outside this door, and there's also some beverages in the back there, and a water fountain past those doors in the back. And now I'll turn it to Jean, who will explain the lottery process. So, um, for the lottery process, so for the lottery process, Shannon, um, if you could bring over the tickets and we'll start doing the first drawing. Oh, we have it. Okay. So we're going to pick nine tickets. And the way this is going to work, you guys, we're going to pick nine at a time. We have three seats right here, three seats right here, and then the three at the table. So we'll pick nine at a time. And when I pick yours, you're going to be, we're going to post it up there. You'll see it. And you'll be in one of those. Top is at the table, middle is in the back seat. Uh, bottom is these seats and we'll rose, move through them like that. We also, the city had a Twitter feed for this, um, for these hearings, for these uh, forums uh, over the last couple of weeks and we're going to pause a few points in the process to read a few of the Twitter, uh, a few of the tweets that have come through. So we'll have that and in addition to that, um, the council has invited several community liaisons to come to speak. Um, we'll be starting with the Burmese community, and I understand we have a couple of folks from the Burmese community. So if you guys would like to um, take, go ahead and take a seat while we get started. In addition to that, um, the council would welcome any, er, any, if there are some folks with disabilities or young children, little children, and you need to leave early, we can take a few folks early that outside the lottery system. So is there anybody here with young children who are dying to get out the door? Okay, one, two, I'm gonna do three. One, two, three, there you go. Okay, you're one, you're two, you're three. You guys are the first three ones that are gonna come up there. You guys can come and sit in the chairs right up front. Are there any with disability that would like to speak early so they can leave early? Going, 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 gone. Okay, cool, all right. So with that. Uh, before, before we jump in, um, I'd, I'd like yeah. to make a few more comments. Oh yes, sorry. Very good, uh, and also open signal, I, I think we need closed captioning, so I'm hoping that what's going out live has closed captioning. Could somebody from open signal please confirm that and let us know? Uh, so again, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, again, I just wanna outline the process so far and where we're headed. 
in October of last year, I issued budget guidance to all of the city's bureaus. And I asked the bureaus to focus on very specific concepts. First, despite a strong economy, the cost of providing services in the city of Portland continues to significantly outpace revenue growth. So costs are going like this, revenues are going like this. So even at the height of the economy with record revenues come in, coming in, we still find ourselves in a situation where we have to reduce service levels. And I think all of you, I, I agree with that. And so here's your opportunity to actually help us address that issue. There's key challenges that are facing our community. For example, increasing housing options remains important. Reducing homelessness remains important. Maintaining critical infrastructure, enhancing livability, ensuring public safety and police accountability, pursuing innovation, and pursuing resiliency all continue to be important priorities. We've asked the bureaus to focus on their core missions and set and track performance measures to keep our government accountable. We asked bureaus to submit budget reduction options to give the council a realistic look at what it takes to maintain mission critical programs while also prioritizing investments that address key challenges facing our community today. Just to give you one concrete example, um, last year we spent about $27 million on addressing the homeless crisis. So that was homeless prevention, that was homeless interventions, emergency shelter services, addiction treatment, mental health services, and transition into housing. That was $27 million that was not spent even a few years prior. So that's just one example of the kind of expenditures that increasingly we need to consider as we address current issues. In January, the Bureau submitted their requested budgets based on the budget guidance. In March, the City Budget Office reviewed those budget requests and offered recommendations on, of their own based on those requests. And I want to be very clear, that's what you have heard about, but that was largely a budget balancing exercise. That's where we are tonight. The City Council has not yet weighed in on any of these budgetary issues. So you are coming in at exactly the same time that we are coming in and evaluating the work that the bureaus and the budget office have provided. So the next step in the process after public input is I will provide my proposed budget at the end of April. That will be followed by council deliberations and the adoption of the budget in June. And uh, I cannot underscore enough how challenging this process is going to be. As I said, the costs continue to grow faster than revenues. Uh, our priorities for this budget are to increase the affordability and accessibility of housing to help those experiencing homelessness to get off and be able to stay off the streets, enhancing the livability of our city, not only downtown, but throughout the neighborhoods as well, and ensuring that Portland is a safe community for everyone. And it's been made very clear to me and to this entire council that we're looking for innovative and bold proposals. So uh, I want to uh, underscore a couple of points tonight as we get into public testimony. First of all, if you're here with a large group and you're focused on a particular issue, we don't necessarily need to hear from 50 or 60 people on the same issue. It's okay to pick four or five or six people who are spokespeople for your group and we'll ask all of you to come forward. We will count you. Uh, we will make sure that your group gets full credit for having everybody here and supporting it. Um, that is item number one and that helps us get through everybody who wants to testify and have their perspective heard. 
beyond just supporting programs that were offered up for reduction by either the bureaus or the budget office. It's also really important for us to hear from you what's important to you. There's a lot of issues throughout the city and this is a great opportunity to use this as a bit of a town hall forum and let us know what issues are on your mind. What are you concerned about? Where do you think we should be investing more? Or alternatively, where do you think we should be investing less? And finally, uh, since uh, I see a bunch of signs in the back, I want to be very clear. I don't approach budgeting as an exercise in reducing critical services. I will tell you, I am also looking very aggressively for revenue sources to help offset the cuts in this budget. So feel free to chime in on that as well. And last but not least, I will just ask everybody, since it's a crowded room and there's lots of people who want to testify, please use our council rules. Don't shout out. Don't drown people out. Don't boo people who are giving testimony that's different than your own opinion. Let's be respectful. Hear everybody out. Uh, thumbs up if you like something. Thumbs down if you don't. But please don't shout out or boo or interrupt people's testimony. Can we do that tonight? All right. Thank you, everybody. I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thanks for being here. Okay, thank you. So before we begin, I do want to just go over a few ground rules and tips to make this a uh, successful meeting. Um, you know, first, treat everyone with respect. There's going to be a lot of different points of view in the room today. Every point of view is valid, so keep that in mind. Um, next, make sure to honor the time limit. We're going to have two minutes per person that speaks. Allison here will be our timekeeper, and she, has, she will lift up a yellow sign when you have 30 seconds left and a red sign when your time is up. So we will ask you to um, keep within those time limits. And also, in order to respect the time, you, like, um, like the mayor said, if you agree with the point, give a thumbs up, raise your hand, instead of um, clapping and cheering loudly to save time. Uh, we encourage you to avoid uh, repeating other, other people's comments. If you like what someone said, say, I agree with that person, and then save your time to make additional points. Also, please avoid side conversation. This is going to be a loud space, so if you need to speak, just leave the room and do silence your cell phones. And a, a couple of tips uh, for your public testimony. Make your key points first, because you may run out of time. Two minutes goes by very quickly. And also, if you um, find that your number is called in the lottery, but you would rather give your ticket to somebody else, you may do that. Um, however, you can't give multiple tickets to one person so that that person has you know, four, six, or eight minutes to speak. So with that, we will start um, with the first person here. Uh, so which will be one, one point before we do, apparently we have maxed out the fire capacity. So if you finish speaking and you'd be willing to leave, as somebody leaves, we can let somebody else in. So bear that in mind. And um, also, I didn't point out the timekeeping. Allison sitting over here on the corner is going to be showing you when your time is. When you see the yellow, that means you have 30 seconds left. When you see the red, please stop. And it's really about being fair for the other people to speak. Okay. Hello, my name is Paul Mang Paugwalnam. I want to thank Council for the opportunity to the Myanmar community to address you tonight. They're here to ask you to fund Prosper Portland's division at package request. I am Division Midway Alliance Community Organizer. DMA is committed to a safe, healthy, and prosperous outdoor out division street for the people who currently live, work, and own business along division in East Poland. DMA started Myanmar Neighborhood Community Office Hour in 2016 as a volunteer program. Since that time, over 1,600 Myanmar community members have been helped through DMA office. 491 people have come to DMA for help so far this year. As DMA relationship built with the Myanmar community, members truly see DMA office as its neighborhood office. The Myanmar community members in the audience holding green funding division aid packet signs have all received support from DMA office. 
The testimony you hear tonight are stories of how this program has helped the Myanmar community living in East Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time here today. My name is Mohamed Mohibula. Thank you for your time here. I came from Rakhine State in Myanmar and I'm a Rohingya. I came to Poland in 2015 from Malaysia. Today, I, you gave me opportunity to share about the neighborhood office. Since I came to Portland, Oregon, I'm working as a forklift operator. Uh, because of my family issue, I've been in the legal troubles since 2016. Because of that issue, I've been uh, known to the system, the legal system, and how things work out here. Now, during that time, I need a lot of support and help, and nobody I can find to get help. Since uh, then, I even decided to move back to Malaysia without my family. After I found out there's a neighborhood office, the neighborhood office volunteers are helping me to get the uh, meeting with the, my lawyer, my attorney, and the judge, and everything's well so far. And they're helping me for paperwork and meeting with uh, advising from the attorney, and they support me a lot. By their advice, I almost completed my probation periods and I'm very successful with my probation. Because of that, I can focus on my job and I can focus on my child and I, my family is a lot better now. Without the help from neighborhood office, I, I might be back in Malaysia. And from through the neighborhood office, I myself can help uh, volunteer uh, other community members. And I also let other people know that there is a neighborhood office and they provide a lot of free service, and myself help translating. And myself is a parent of two kids. I, I sometimes help uh, child care at the office. So I would like to uh, say funding division midway package. Thank you. My name is Gaypo. I want to thank Council for the opportunity for the Myanmar community address here. I came from Myanmar and I'm a Kareni. I came to Poland in 2010. For the past four years, I work as a home care provider for developmental uh, disabled kids. I'm a 
2016, because of my family income, we got cut off from the organ health plan. So I kind of lost health insurance since then. I don't know what to do with at the time. And at the time, I found out there is a neighborhood office and they are helping for this. From there, they helped me to get into the marketplace and now I'm covered. And other uh, about reporting my weekly uh, report for about my uh, home care, they're helping me to what to do with that. Uh, in the United States, to secure a job and keep the job is very important for a family like me. And especially for job and other family support and um, health insurance, neighborhood office is really helpful for my family and my community. So I would like to request to keep uh, funding division at package. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So Dine Dine Yama, Sagabiyo Kunyare Tocho, Amyayi Jizu Timbare. Thank you so much for the council to uh, allow me to speak here tonight. I never have imagined or have a dream like speak in front of people like all of you guys. And I will say hi to everyone. So, uh, My name is Sundar Singh. I came from Chin State from Myanmar. I came here uh, from Malaysia in 2011. I've been here for six years. What I'm interested today is so, I'm looking for uh, to start my own business here in Portland. I'm working right now at a sushi bar in Poland. I'm looking for a good spot to open my business for the past three years. And I cannot find and I don't know what to do with that. I save some money. But I need some more uh, capital investment. And I met with Paul Mang from Division Midway Alliance. And they advised me. And they introduced me with the uh, PSU business outreach program. And they provide me with a training. And they get advice me what to do. And I, there is a, we can uh, get a loan from uh, the city, and I didn't know before that. And the PSU advisor, Emily, and Division Midway Alliance helped me through all those steps. I would like to say thank you for those help. And I'm really surprised what's going on here today. If the office is no longer providing service, uh, people like me is, will really in trouble. And when I meet with the mainstream, uh, people smile at me. 
But I, we don't know what to say, uh, tell them back, so we're like uh, idiot. So, so it's not that we're bad people, but we just a uh, difficult time to say hi back. I want to say today, I, I can do pic uh, taking picture very nice. And I can cook very good cook. And I need your help and your support. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So we'll have these three here who had uh, young children come up first. Um, and Commissioner Yu Daly will invite a few folks up to testify after that. Um, and just continuing that order, we're then going to call three of the lottery numbers, which are listed up there. I'll, I'll read those out um, a little bit later. I know that not everyone can probably see that. And there we see several groups here um, that are representing certain issues. And we would invite testi testimony of three people from each of those groups. And I think I count about four groups. I see the red group, I'm just gonna call you by no uh, color. The red group, the blue uh, group, light green, dark green, and the, the green signs, or DSA, okay. Um, so we'll, we'll address that in, mo in a moment. But if you see your number up here, know that we're going to go through one round of the lottery first. So the oh first nine. Um, by the way, we had a question about the timing on the previous. When there is interpretation, we're doubling the time to allow for the interpretation. So. Good evening. My name is Dawn Hecker, and this is my son, Arlo Hecker. We are here today to deliver nearly 3,000 petition signatures that support keeping all of our community centers and the Laurelhurst Dance Center open. I understand, I understand that you've also received a few postcards, handwritten postcards in the past week or so. And I don't know if you've heard, but we also had a little rally on St. Patrick's Day. On short notice, we gathered over 300 supporters. When we, spoke to, when we went to the streets with our paper version of the petition, every person we spoke to said how obvious it was that the community resources, like our community centers, are non-negotiable. They, along with a properly funded school system, are part of a proactive solution to the problems our city faces today. We need to look at the long game here. I believe we've already said in all the ways possible and for all good reasons that it is not acceptable to shut down our precious community centers. We feel that we have yet again been put up to the job of staging the protest for you and for parks and recreation so that a short-term funding solution can buy us a little more time. It's a tremendous amount of effort, energy, and money that I would much rather pour into fundraising, increasing programming and revenue, and building a proper fence for the Woodstock Community Center. I'm sure that our protest has cost your offices a significant amount of time, energy, and money as well. We should also factor the costly effects on employee engagement and reduced consumer confidence in this repeated threat creates. Why do we have to be in opposition every year? Why can't we put our resources together and make this right instead? We're squabbling over $35,000 or even $200,000. Are we? Thank you. Hi. Thank you. My name is Julie Curran. I'm a Selwood resident working mother of three small children. This is my middle boy here. I'm here to oppose the proposed closure of Selwood Community Center, along with Woodstock, Fulton Park, Hillside, and Laurelhurst Dance Studio. I'm also the founder of Facebook group, Save Our Community Centers PDX, which has grown to nearly 300 members since founded February 1st. I founded that group in a moment of panic. 
As a working mom, I, like many families in our neighborhoods, rely on the Selwood Community Center's after-school program. 100 students from 5 to 11 years of age are bused directly from Llewellyn and Dunaway Elementary Schools to the Community Center for quality, affordable after-school care. There's 100 students there and 45 on the wait list. During the summer programs, there's 170 spots, anywhere from 15 to 75 students on that wait list. We need to be increasing services, not decreasing services. With the closure of the Boys and Girls Club in 2016, we lost a major support of child care resources in our neighborhood. Nothing has replaced that. Both the schools are maxed out to capacity. They have expanded on-site after-school programs as far as they can for space limitations, and they each have their own lengthy wait lists. There is no plan B. Not for me, not for 100 plus other families in the areas. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jay Kerbs. I'm a father of two, a lifelong Portland resident, and a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Despite the tents and makeshift shelters that populate every open patch of land throughout the city in the Portland area, we are experiencing an unprecedented boom in wealth. According to research from the Economic Pol Policy Institute, well over a thousand households in the Monoma County report incomes over and above $1 million. Rents have never been higher and luxury condos seem to be popping up everywhere. Why should anyone be forced to sleep in a tent in the shadow of one of the dozens of cranes that are building new high rises in our city? In the context of this abundance of wealth, why should the rest of us be forced to accept a city budget of, on cuts and austerity? Why not find a way to raise revenue? I say we tax the rich to fund housing assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'll call out the next lottery numbers. I'm only going to be calling the last three numbers on your ticket. So if you hear your number, please come up and sit in these chairs. There's three chairs here, three back there, and three in the front row. I apologize. Um, by, by the way, if, if people are here as part of a group oh. and you'd like to come up and stand with the folks as they're speaking, that's fine. We're, we're happy to have that happen. Thank you. And I apologize. We actually have some invited testimony first, but I will go ahead and read out the numbers so that you're ready. So the numbers are, remember the last three on your ticket, 690-838-836-686-751-406-430-527 and 414. Commissioner. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I would like to ask Arlene Kamora, from the, who's the chair of the Hazelwood Neighborhood Association, and Zina Mudafar from EPAP to come give two minutes of testimony. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Zina Mudafar. I'm from Iraqi Society of Oregon and from EPAP Civic Engagement. Uh, الغاية من الالتماس هو تشجيع ودعم مدينة بورتلاند للتواصل بشكل فعال مع مجتمع بورتلاند المحلي المتنوع والذي يتسم بقلة المشاركة بصورة منهجية. To encourage and support the city of Portland effectively communicate with Portland diverse and systematically under, under, undergage community. نحن الموقعين أدناه نوصي بوضع صندوق على نطاق المدينة بمساهمات تعادل 0.5% لكل ميزانية تابعة لمكتب المدينة لتمويل تلبية الاحتياجات. 
يجب على تلبية الاحتياجات هذه أن تشمل لكن لا تقتصر على الترجمة اللغوية رعاية الأطفال ووصول ذوي الإعاقات البدنية إلى كافة الوظائف التي تؤديها مدينة بورتلاند. We undersigned recommended that the city-wide fund be created on contribution of 0.5% uh, per city bureau budget to finance accommodation. These accommodation need to include, but not to be limited to language interpretation and translation, child care and physical accessibility for city of Portland function. هذا التخصيص سيساهم بطريقة مباشرة أو غير مباشرة في تنمية المجتمعات الصغيرة للوصول بها إلى أقصى مستوى من التوافق المهني والاجتماعي مع المجتمع الأمريكي الكبير. This fund will help our small community to reach the brilliant level of professional consensus and socially uh, with American community. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, Mayor Good and evening. Council Members. Thank you very much. All right, to get to the point, I have asked for a uh, time to speak about an ad package that ONI is putting out for $200,000 plus to bring the East Portland Neighborhood Office to some sort of equity, not entirely complete, but getting much closer so that we could do the work that involves our immigrant and community members as well as those marginalized by the process of displacement in, from inner Portland to outer East Portland. We thank you for this opportunity and I wanna support Zena and her work um, she has been very, very helpful in, in making sure that we understand how difficult it is to have translation, and yet she tries so hard to get that information to her community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So now let's have the next three come up here, 690, 838, and 836. <clears throat> Uh, hello, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I'm Rob Nose. I'm the state representative for House District 42, uh, which encompasses inner Southeast Portland, a little sliver of Northeast Portland and the Woodstock neighborhood. And I'm here this evening to oppose the proposed funding cuts to the parks and recreation budget for the indoor community centers, particularly in the Selwood and Woodstock community and, and the Laurelhurst Dance Studio. I, uh, I became aware of this issue when my office started receiving emails from concerned constituents who utilize the centers and who appreciate having some public indoor space as well. And I asked if there was something I could do about it. And so I said, sure, I could at least come to this. First and foremost, I, I just want to highlight how crucial it is to support public indoor spaces. These are places for families to come together and children to be active while they're protected from the elements. And you know, in case you hadn't noticed, it, it rains here a little bit. Okay, good, people laughed. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> um, all kidding aside though, uh, after school and summer programs are constructive outlets for young people in these neighborhoods as well as affordable to their parents. Not everyone, as you know, works a standard nine to five schedule or can afford to take time off or hire a regular babysitter during summer breaks. And giving those kids even a couple of hours of structured activity time is beneficial to their development and helpful to their parents. Community centers, as we've heard, also offer affordable preschool and increasing rarity in our city. Pulling funding for these two centers means increasing workloads for the employees at the remaining centers, which means less individual attention for the young people that they are working with. I'll just, I'm, I'm getting the buzzer here. Please don't close these centers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, for being here. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Michelle Sanders, and myself and my husband, Miguel Salinas, own a business called Attic Journals here in East Portland. I'm here to request that you fund the Small Business Growth Ad Package in the amount of $275,000 as a one-time allocation for the next year. Businesses owned by women and people of color represent a large majority of Portland small businesses, yet represent the smallest percentages of growth and wealth creation due to significant barriers that I myself have experienced. In partnership with Prosper Portland, the PSU Business Outreach Program and Accelerate have created executive education programs specifically geared towards helping underserved entrepreneurs 
scale their existing businesses. These programs arm us, have armed me with the tools and education to overcome sus significant systemic challenges, create wealth, and contribute to the vitality of our community. As a kid raised in East Portland, who went to this high school, who worked hard to not become a truck driver like the rest of my family, when I came into a life of a small business owner, working with the business outreach program really acted as a translation service for me. There were so many pitfalls and so many ways that I could have made grave mistakes as a business owner and created problems for our entire community by being a poor employer, by creating businesses that you wouldn't be proud of. But because I aligned myself and found the resources of the business outreach program through the Hispanic Chamber, through the city of Portland's own programs, we have really thrived. I'm able to negotiate conversations where people are asking, do you want 5,000 pieces, 25,000 pieces, or 50,000 pieces? And I don't freak out when they ask those questions. I'm able to respond because I've been supported, aided, and abetted in the crime of growing and thriving as a business owner in this city. I want to conclude by saying that your support is critical to supporting the wealth creation in underserved communities. I came back to Portland because I knew that you were a city that believed in the dreams that I had. I could have done those in California or South Texas, but I came back home to do that with you. Please support these guys. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good evening. My name is Ray Rafalik. I'm, I'm here to speak on behalf of Elders in Action. I'm a personal advocate with Elders in Action, have been, uh, that, uh, been in that capacity since September of 2013. Um, as a personal advocate, I've helped uh, seniors who are trying to solve problems and cope with challenges that put them at risk in continuing to live independently, primarily health and financial risks. So through Elders in Action, their personal advocates have stepped forward to work directly with seniors who struggle on their own or don't have family members to help them. We get referrals from agencies that don't have staff to cover all the seniors in their needs in the community. Um, Elders in Action responds to more than 3,000 requests for assistance from seniors each year. Uh, the staff and volunteers of Elders in Action extend the reach of social service programs, and the uh, Elders in Action volunteers, more than 100 of them, multiply the benefits of these programs through the hours they dedicate to senior clients. So please continue funding Elders in Action so we can help senior residents of Portland solve their problems of daily living. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we'll have these two gentlemen come up. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have three numbers that are missing so far. So number 751, 430, and 527 if you're here. Oh, OK, great. Um, and I, are, are there any other elected officials in the room? We had Representative Nose. Is there any other elected official here? Very good, thank you. So, um, number 686 has asked to speak with her group. So she's moving to the last three and will be, you guys will be up next. Actually, he's part of my group. Oh, he's part of your group? Okay. Well, why don't you guys sit right there? Um, well, we were going to say, we were going to suggest no more than three for the really big groups. I don't know how big your group is. I asked one group that's one row long. Okay, that's a big group. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with three. So you guys pick three to go. And you'll be one of the, so you could sit right there or whichever. Oh, but yeah, actually, why don't you switch with her and then your whole group can go. Go ahead. Oh, oh, he's with that group too? Oh, all right. Although the green was a really nice color scheme. So. Why don't you go ahead and then we'll do that group. <laughs> My name is Kim Appleberry with the Fulton Community Association. And I'm here to support keeping Fulton Park rental facility open. You, the council, the council, we have many people. I'm not sure how you can count us, but um, do your can, best. Can we see a show of hands again? Let's see how many people are in Fulton. Is there anybody left in Fulton? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, and thank you. 
So council, um, in a number of years, has asked PPNR to make programs revenue neutral to the general fund. Um, the quotes I'm using, the numbers I'm using, are all from the PPNR requested budget. It says on the PPNR budget proposal states the savings generated from closure at Fulton Park would be realized through the reduction of maintenance service to the building as no general fund support is currently allocated to the operations at Fulton. I think Fulton is being unfairly lumped with Hillside. That makes sense in the oversight that you've had, but it doesn't make sense in the budget numbers. Fulton is not, a, uh, Park says it's not, there's no support from the general fund. Another factor that uh, has been put forward in the budget for closure of Fulton is that the uh, center, the, the funds need to go to other neighborhoods that Fulton is in a more affluent and less diverse neighborhood. Well, that may be true, but there's a difference. Fulton is not a community center, it's a rental building. Who are the renters in there? They draw from the whole city. The contra dancers, the other dancers, the school draws from the whole city. It is no longer a local neighborhood facility. Thank you, sir. I just have to comment, it's actually, it's not just the whole city, it's the region, and we got a letter from somebody from Roseburg who was advocating for keeping it open, so it is something that's uh, of service to the whole community. Yeah. Right. Um, my name is Sue Songer, and I'm part of the Fulton team here, and I want to read a little bit from the vision statement that's on the front page of um, your website. Uh, saying that your vision is to develop parks, recreation facilities, and programs that promote community in the city. And we are doing your work for you. Um, we are promoting community in a way that is rare to find. To be a part of the Saturday night group of dancers, you don't need to believe anything. You don't need to join anything. Um, it helps if you can walk in time to music. Um, but you pay a, a very modest fee to come. And the only thing that we ask is that people treat everyone in our presence with respect. Um, we span all ages, um, and as Kim said, from all parts of the city. Uh, I want to read to you a few things people have said about coming to Contra Dancing. Um, we are like a big family. We gather to show joy, sadness, music, song, and dance, sweat, and tears. It's the family you could have had if you could have chosen. This is the most welcoming group I've ever been in. I came here the first time alone, and I was nervous. Everyone took me in. After that, I never felt I had to come with anyone again. And from a child, I felt ambivalent about going to contra dances when I was young, but when I returned home from college and stepped into a dance hall, I was overcome with emotion. How fortunate I had been growing up in such a wholesome, colorful, musical community. Now I hope to take my own children. Um, we, we have family dances, and the, I think it's a testimony to how um, devoted we are to each other and to our activity. And, and to Fulton that so many are here. Thank you, appreciate it. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to advocate for elders in action. My name is Barbara Bernstein, I'm the executive director. And the Office of Neighborhood Involvement has made and the CBO, CBO has endorsed a recommendation for an immediate and drastic cut to Elders in Action funding with the intention of discontinuing it completely in one year. Acting upon ONI's recommendation to defund Elders in Action will immediately diminish the city's current service and engagement of older adults without any alternate plan in place. Cutting services will immediately 
Cutting services immediately to an aging population whose needs are currently growing sends the wrong message to an important constituency. The City of Portland has made an important investment in our work, an investment that leverages three times its direct financial investment for programs and services and advocacy, and another 240,000 worth in volunteer hours. These hours represent an extraordinary human capital return on investment. Dismantling such community capacity and the long-standing relationships and partnerships it includes will, will needlessly create a costly and difficult task of rebuilding. There are two significant demographic changes facing our city today. Both bring with them challenges and delights. We are becoming a more ethnically and racially diverse city, and the city of Portland is making a concerted, concerted commitment to ethnic and racial equity. But we are also aging, and aging magnifies the cumulative effects of inequities that have impacted an individual's life course. In 2040, older adults will constitute 20% of the population, and one out of three of these will identify as non-white. The effects of race, ethnicity, gender, and class are multiplied as we age. Many of the stories you will hear about elders, oh, darn. <laughs> Let me just say that I urge the city to continue to leverage its longstanding investment in elders in action and further its commitment to a thriving, age-friendly city. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for being here. So we'll have these um, three participants come up, uh, two members from the Locally Grown group um, and one from the Fulton Park group. And then we're, we're gonna ask two members of the Youth for Environmental Justice group to come up, and then two members from the East Portland Action Plan to come up, and then we'll have five lottery numbers, and, those, and then we'll have nine lottery numbers, and I'll read those out now, so be ready. Uh, five, six, one, five, seven, nine, 728-749-386-673-565-515 and 387. 656. We'll put this up a little bit higher too. You can come up closer if you need to. That's good, we have people paying attention over there. That's great. Good evening. Good evening, thank you. Uh, since somebody has already spoken eloquently about the community centers, uh, I'm gonna speak about another issue, which is the graffiti abatement program. Um, graffiti has really changed uh, the character of our city. As we know, it invites property crime and other kinds of crime. It diminishes both residential and commercial property values. It inhibits business activities such as retail and uh, restaurants and other activities. And it really has a negative effect on tourism, uh, which is a large part of our economy which, uh, because it creates a negative image of our city. And the longer graffiti stays up, the, the more negative effect it has. And while we do appreciate Ex the Excuse me. Uh, folks, that is very disrespectful. We said right up front that there would be people who would have different opinions than you do, and that is okay. That's a democracy. You can do this if you don't like what he's saying, but please do not hiss or shout or interrupt his testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And while we do appreciate the PDX Reporter app, um, uh, response times can be slow to non-existent given the, the sheer volume. Uh, and so, um, and it's really, I think, uh, a joint uh, responsibility of the city and its citizens to identify and abate graffiti. So I have four, uh, a four-part proposal. Uh, most people don't know that there are only two employees uh, assigned to the graffiti abatement program, and those two positions are on the chopping block. So I would recommend increasing that by at least two. Um, uh, number one, to create a mobile uh, team to act as the eyes and ears of the city and identify uh, graffiti on public, uh, public property. Number two, to really start to enforce the um, graffiti laws uh, and make property owners more responsible for graffiti that's on private property. Uh, and, um, and I'll finish with the, the last point, which is to uh, increase volunteerism among the citizens by coordinating volunteer efforts to go out on a Saturday afternoon. I'm sure you get hundreds of people interested if you could uh, coordinate that activity uh, by um, 
taking crews out and, um, and just like Solve does, but not very often, um, uh, to uh, uh, help uh, create a solution to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm really nervous. I did not expect that. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Okay, so um, I'm here, uh, my name is Jadra, and I'm here um, to represent the red shirt crowd from the um, Fulton Park um, Contra Dance group. And um, the, uh, <laughs> thanks guys. Uh, community centers and, um, and Fulton is uh, part of the heart of the Parks and Rec Department in their mission to bring community together. And um, Contra Dance specifically is a, a community building activity. And we work really hard to be a welcoming place and uh, we have um, people uh, of all ages and it's one of the few activities that um, I know of that you can uh, participate in that's very accessible and doesn't require a lot of experience uh, or knowledge or skill before you arrive that you can um, uh, participate in with people from all age ranges. There's not a lot of things like that around. And so we have people that come regularly every Saturday that are 20-somethings and teenagers all the way up to people in their 70s and 80s, I think, right? Just like Christine, <laughs> yes. So this is like a sort of demonstration of at least two of us that are here. Um, anyway, the uh, Fulton has been um, Portland Contra Dance's uh, home for many years, and it is kind of the, the rock that we gather at. And um, don't take Fulton away. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Peter Adams. I'm the financial manager of the Friends of Woodstock Community Center. I'd like to speak in opposition to the proposed closure of the Fulton Hillside, Selwood, and Woodstock community centers. Portland Parks and Rec have been blessed with funds collected through system development charges assessed on new development. They are required to, and they use these funds to acquire new property and develop new parks. But these SDC funds cannot be used to operate and maintain that inventory of parks. PPNR already has a huge problem with deferred maintenance. The SDC-led growth worsens the maintenance backlog and serves as an excuse to close centers which do not fit into their vision, a vision which apparently creates a gaping void in community centers south of Gleason and west of Southeast 72nd Avenue. If PPNR fails to efficiently maintain its assets, the new facilities will in time also fall victim to neglect and underinvestment. We are tired of repeated efforts to close these community centers in our neighborhoods. T tired of organizing rallies and petition drives to keep our centers open, centers that provide after-school programs for our children and grandchildren, fitness classes and art classes, meeting spaces for civic groups. We'd much rather spend our time enjoying these community jewels instead of working to keep them open. But if you think we are so tired that we will stop fighting, think again. The Friends of Woodstock Community Center was established in 2004 to fight a similar proposed closure. Since then, we have worked with PPNR, donating thousands of dollars and thousands of volunteer hours. We pay for routine janitorial services, for paper towels and toilet paper. We've replaced floors. We've installed a sustainable kitchen update and take care of the yard maintenance. We are asking for a chance to renew our agreement with PPNR to support the community center in the future. But we need to know that we are working with a bureau that acknowledges and values our contribution, that manages its budget in a way that maintains existing facilities as well as building new ones, one, and one that will protect us from a process that knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Thank you. Thank you. And just a... Just a reminder to please silently voice your support with thumb raises and hands up so that we have more time for speakers. Um, I'll invite the members of the Youth for Environmental Justice up here, and I would ask two members of the East Portland Action Plan to be ready to speak next um, on behalf of your group. Go ahead and come, come over, over there. Those from East Portland Action Plan, there are two seats right over here. And we do have some Twitter comments that we want to read, which we'll uh, read after the um, Youth for Environmental Justice uh, representatives speak. Okay. Oh God. Okay. 
I would like to thank everyone here for their time. I'm immensely grateful to be able to share my thoughts and story with you all today. My name is Nia Calloway. I'm a member of Youth Environmental Justice Alliance. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> a, a, I'm a sophomore at Park Rose High School and a, and a native Portlander. I'm here today to testify in favor of city-based funding for Youth Pass as we find alternative pathways for long-term funding through TriMet. I remember riding the bus and Max almost every day with my mom when I was younger. Then once I was old enough to ride alone, I practically went everywhere. The first time I ever explored downtown was by way of Max. My grandfather has worked with TriMet for over 35 years and almost everyone in my family at one point or still currently uses pu public transportation to get around the city. So I'm no stranger to TriMet or public transit. But I can tell you with full belief that in the two years that I have been in high school that I have use public transit more than in the previous years of my life combined. With Youth Pass, I am currently able to be a more engaged and flexible student and, have a, and be a very active leader in my community. I don't have to worry about my pass expiring in 2.5 hours. I can be a highly involved participant of clubs, stay after to get help from my teacher, or support classmates at games and events. At Park Rose, approximately 348 students are currently getting to and from school or wherever else they need to be because of the expansion of the Youth Pass program. This is great participation for the first year of, its progr of, it, of this program and I expect more students to use it in years to come. This program aids our, our, city's, our city students in too many ways to count. Continued funding would benefit every Portland community whose youth can, can thrive by means of internships, youth groups, school clubs, and volunteering. Please ensure that Youth Pass is written into the city's budget so that we can have continued access for the 2018 through 19 school year. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you. First, I would like to thank you all for letting me speak. Thank My you. name is Brandon Ding. I'm a resident of Portland, Oregon, a junior at David Douglas High School, this high school, and most importantly, a member of the Youth Environmental Justice Alliance, YEJA. I'm here today to talk about the Youth Pass program and why the continuation of funding the program is beneficial to the students of East Portland as a whole. This community budget forum is being held at this high school where roughly a third of the students here rely on this very program. As we continue to work in partnership with the city representatives to find long-term sustainable funding for the Youth Pass, we want to ensure the next year is not left open. While we ideally foresee a Youth Pass program that is covered by TriMet, we do not want to leave the next year open, especially as this has been the first imp implementation year here at David Douglas. The old school buses here have a major issue of overcrowding. There are times in which we have to sit three students to a seat just to get home. Because of access to youth has, students have voiced seeing improvements in overcrowding on the school buses. I have another friend who uh, on occasion misses the school bus. Youth has improved the situation by giving him an opportunity to arrive at school hassle-free. It's not just about schools, all, though. Um, Every day travel is very important. Youth Pass gives low-income students the privilege to commute. I strongly urge the City Council to keep funding this program while we work to transition funding out of the city and into other sustainable sources. As we've voiced here, it continues to, means, to mean a lot to us students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. to all of you. So now uh, we will have two members of the East Portland Action Plan speak on behalf of their group. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Adriana Govea. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Adriana Govea. Uh, thank you for coming to East Portland. And I would like to say thank you for support East Portland Action Plan. And uh, I would like to say no, de, no del sentido contrario o de mala uh, fe. So, not to be contrary or in bad faith. Pero los, uh, los grupos o los virios eh, no están trabajando como deberían de trabajar. Los uh, grupos, los, uh, los que dan en los fondos o los... Because the, the groups, the, the groups that are, that are giving the funds are not working how they should be. Yo no vengo aquí a decirles cómo hagan su trabajo. I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. Pero vengo a pedirles que por favor desempeñen lo mejor que puedan. 
but I'm here to ask you to please do the job the best that you can. Yo no vengo a pedir cosas injustas, no vengo a pedir cosas que no son realistas, vengo a pedir por toda una comunidad, pero más importante, por East Portland Action Plan. I'm not here to ask for anything that's unfair, I'm not here to ask for anything that's not realistic, but I am here to ask and stand up for the community and for more than anything, the East Portland Action Plan. Una vez más, les vuelvo a decir gracias y para nosotros, qué honor que venga al, al este de Portland, al sureste. And again, I would like to thank you. And again, for us, it's an honor that you came to East Portland. Thank you. Gracias. Hi, I'm Lori Boyson. Um, I am a member of the Economic Development Subcommittee, the, I'm sorry, the East Portland Action Plan Economic Development Subcommittee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Um, part one of the items on the Economic Development Subcommittee's strategic priorities is to fund the NPIs in East Portland. And part of that fund package is Prosper Portland's ad package for the division transit and safety projects. I'm here to ask you to please fund that project um, as part of EPAP's economics um, priorities. I also am here to ask you to fund the Gateway Education Center and look for ways to make that a reality for East Portland. We all know that it is a, it is, um, a priority for East Portland Action Plan and we hope that you could find a way to fund that pro program because it would benefit our East Portland residents greatly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So in a moment, Jean will read some of the Twitter comments. And uh, before that, we have a few lottery numbers that were drawn that are not sitting up here yet. So if you have one of these numbers, please get in the queue. We have 579, 673, 656, and 517. So we'll have the first three numbers sit up here and uh, start providing testimony. And after this group, Sophia, if you can be ready, we'll do a few of the tweets. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Chloe Thompson and I am, I am OpenSignal's web development and IT manager. OpenSignal offers Sp English and Spanish language technical classes with scholarship options for accessibility. Our classes certify producers to have free ongoing access to our equipment, library, facilities, and a platform to share the content they create. As part of our commitment to equity, our staff and board are growing to more accurately reflect the communities we serve. 48% of our staff and 66% of our board are people of color. In the last half of 2017, or <laughs> to, to, uh, goodness, 2017, 48% um, of students reported annual income under $30,000. Filmmaking is a means of creating and documenting both oral and visual histories, which is an inherently empowering act, specifically for histories which may otherwise be overlooked within the context of, our, of a rapidly changing cityscape. Outside of classes, we host space, virtual and physical, for our intergenerational producer community to create collaborative content. By accessing our resources, people practice marketable skills through active learning. One of our programs, Echo Air, is a no-cost residency for youth filmmakers to gain technical skills and mentorship through telling their stories. We also partner with local organizations such as Outside the Frame, a film, initi a film initiative working with houseless youth to break down barriers. Through my past personal experience as an at-risk youth, I understand the necessity of these outlets as a means to advance personal growth and resilience. There is no limit to the return value of investment in creating platforms and physical spaces which enable people to collectively gather, share stories, and document current events. These are reasons I choose to work with OpenSignal and can recommit to the work our organization does on a daily basis. I implore you to do the same by protecting our budget in the upcoming cycle um, and preventing what would be a catastrophic 30% cut to our funding. Thank you for your previous support of our organization and your time today. Thank you. I'm Norman Farrell, and speaking in support of the, the Fulton Park Community Center building. Um, some years ago, Fulton Park Center was transitioned to a rental, 
and as such became not exactly a community center any longer, uh, but a rental asset for the entire city of Portland. Uh, as you know, the community you depend on Fulton is in every part of Portland and beyond from uh, numbers, uh, city budget. Uh, we have an idea that the cost per person per visit to use Fulton is very economical. Uh, depending on what numbers we use, maybe as low as $2 per person per visit, making it maybe even the best bargain in the entire city from that standpoint. Uh, cost of operations and maintenance, though, in this older building, not a surprise uh, that they're huge, but realistic rents haven't been charged, uh, rates haven't been increased, the building hasn't really been managed as if it is a true rental asset with aggressive booking and, and value-based costs. Um, we expect landlords to maintain their building, but it doesn't seem that that's been happening either. Damage uh, sustained over the years and the building is not, not repaired. Uh, I presume the city of Portland has some process through self-insurance uh, to take care of this. What's happening with that? Um, and last week, finally, we learned that uh, from Portland uh, Parks and Rec's operation that there's really been a plan to sell the building all along. Um, very disturbing to those of us who value Fulton so highly. Um, one story is told by the uh, openness of public comment in a meeting like this, and another story is told uh, if a closure decision and disposal of the building has already been made. Um, what's the story? We're not exactly sure. Uh, but I can say this, if Fulton is closed, the city will lose the revenue that it generates currently. And on top of that, I, I frankly seriously doubt by looking at the budget numbers closely that unless people are fired, there's really gonna be any serious tangible savings from stopping the operation of Fulton. Uh, I urge the city to find a way to think about managing the building differently if possible. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. My name is John Ward and I'm new to Portland. I moved here two years ago and I'm a happy camper. Portland is great. And one of the things that makes it great are its community centers. I live five minutes from the Woodstock Community Center. Our fans are out here. <laughs> Every Wednesday, I have to write a memoir, and then I have to show up in Emily's class and read my memoir to the seniors at the, at the class. And uh, imagine a senior with homework every week. But that's good, not bad. To my point, our senior citizens are an untapped source of wisdom, local history, and family memories. That vital information needs to be passed on to our children, grandchildren, neighbors, friends, and even to our governmental leaders. Because the senior, because the senior citizens have been there, done that, and they have something to contribute. They need a local community center to provide the programs to keep them a vital part of our community. Portland has great community centers. They should be expanded, not torn down. A whole new wave of seniors is on their way. The boomers are starting to arrive in force. Keep Portland special. Save Woodstock, Selwood, and the other Portland community centers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we'll hear a few comments from the, um, a few tweets from the Twitter feed. And then we'll move into these three. You can move up. You so, Sophia, are we ready to, pu to yes. pull some up? Yeah, m make sure you keep them clean before you yes. post them. So I should say, if you know of one that you didn't see there and it was full of expletives, it's not going to be read and it's not going to be posted. So first one, com counter, the, counter the bigness bias. Low interest loans for ADUs, incentives for small scale middle housing providers. And that's from Neil Heller. You have another one to post up there? I'd love to see a feasibility study funded jointly with Multnomah County to evaluate the creation of a publicly funded through bonds and operated fiber optic to the premises, broadband internet utility, from Michael Ohana. Okay, let's do one more. Um, 
Ted Wheeler, here is uh, an idea. Give Portland police a sufficient budget to get staffing levels back to where they should be and prepare for the mass loss of officers who will be retiring soon. We need them to keep Portland safe. No booze, you guys. No booze. So, thank you. Okay, and we have uh, another set here. There are several numbers that didn't come up, so if you... Oh, are you one of the numbers that isn't up there? Okay, 656. So if you are 673 or 517, this is your last chance to come take a seat. Uh, and before we get started, um, if you are a member of an organized group that has not had a member who spoke yet, please come see Jean so that we can make sure that we at least hear from one member of each group. And, oh, sorry, one more thing. And if your group has had many people speak, we would encourage you um, to consider giving your lottery ticket to others that may not be part of a group that may have other ideas. Thank you for hearing everyone's testimony tonight. Uh, my name is Lindsay Grazel. I've lived in Portland since 1996. And I think the undercurrent of um, this entire conversation has to deal with the huge changes that Portland is going through in terms of density. And those changes make sense with what is in front of us. Um, our, all of our transportation is being affected. All of our housing is being affected. And in light of that, I think it's important to think about the Portland Parks and Rec budget serving the needs of the people so that Portland continues to be a livable city. Um, everywhere you turn, we're facing challenges and real estate is top on that list. When we close community centers and take them out of the pool as our density is increasing, we're creating a real big problem for people in Portland, especially when it is rainy so many months of the year. So I'm part of the Fulton Group. As you heard, we have dancing every Saturday night. Every time you open up the New York Times these days, there's an article about what's really important for the health of people and the communities is having strong social bonds and exercise. And we do both those things at the same time. <laughs> so I, I would also like to advocate for the, keeping all community centers open. While I use Fulton now to dance, when my kids were younger, they learned how to swim at community centers. They went to after school programs and summer programs all summer long when it was affordable. And the disappearance of that kind of stuff is going to be what makes Portland a more difficult city to live in as we go through this huge change. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Good evening. My name is Olivia, and I'm with the Democratic Socialists of America. Every year, with every budget cycle, we see the same dance play out where necessary services are pitted against one another. Instead of feeling like they can depend on the city, vulnerable communities worry year after year whether or not their programs will stay funded. This is unacceptable. Portland is in the midst of record wealth and a booming economy. Our mayor has responded to this prosperity with an incongruent message. He's calling for a 5% reduction of services across the bureaus, amounting to 4.5 million in cuts. Proposed scenarios include closing down four community centers, cutting funds to immigrant and refugee services, and shutdowns for other vital community services. Reasoning for this paints a narrative of labor unions and pensions of retired public workers as hoarding all the money, but we're not fooled by that. The people who are really hoarding all the money are the millionaires in the West Hills, the developers who own the luxury condos popping up overnight on every street corner. As wealth continues to grow in the city and the county, so does inequality. In 2015, the nearly 4,000 households that comprise the top 1% of Multnomah County reported an average annual income of close to 1.2 million. Meanwhile, the majority of Portlanders are struggling to make rent. In fact, half the city residents believe quality of life is getting worse. Indeed, politicians are divesting from neighborhoods and schools and neglecting infrastructure, education, and public housing. After decades of austerity budgets, Portland has become a city that only works for the very wealthy. We say enough is enough. We reject scarcity budgets. We reject cuts. We reject a framework in which vital services are pitted against each other and residents have to suffer closures of preschools so that other residents can be housed. We reject having to choose between necessities. We demand a budget that prioritizes the needs of the people. Imagine having fundamental rights for our residents, such as housing for all, universal pre-K, fully funded education, and support for immigrant communities. At a time of record wealth in the city of Portland, we should be taxing the rich to fund these services and fight for a city that works for all of us. Mayor Wheeler, as a beneficiary of the Trump tax cuts, we're calling on you to do something. If you don't, you'll be remembered as the millionaire mayor who sat on his hands in his pile of cash when he was asked to act. Thank you, everyone, please. Thank you all. Thank you all, please sit down.
Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners, and everyone who came out tonight. The moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Hubert Humphrey said this. Elders in action is the face of morality in Hubert Humphrey's definition of a moral government. We are committed to helping older adults and the disabled to keep connected, to stay engaged, and to be empowered. Last Thursday, I accompanied a client to a bank branch in downtown. The branch closest to her had recently closed, so while I walked, she maneuvered many blocks in her electric wheelchair, choosing the crossings she knew were the easiest. We were blocked at one point because a homeless camp was spread over most of the sidewalk. While my client was hospitalized, the bank had charged five overdraft fees to her account. On a fixed income, my client faced a financial crisis when she got home. In our meeting at the bank, the manager told us that the customary practice of calling the client to warn of the overdraft had not occurred, possibly due to the move. Not only did he waive some of the fees, but he also gave my client a tutorial in online banking and a cautionary message about giving family members access to her account. In this case, the connection that Elders in Action strives to develop went both ways. As we were leaving, the manager looked at my client and said, when you come in again, I will know your name. For my client, she has a place and a person to connect with when she needs financial assistance, and she is empowered with her new knowledge of online banking. For the manager, he has a clearer understanding of how to serve the needs of the elders in our city. For me, Susan Sowers, a personal advocate with Elders in Action, all of my volunteer experiences have been invaluable. I am taking vital notes for my own future. Thank you. All the next two come up, please. My name is Natalia Sabalevska, and I'm. Um, the microphone. My name is Natalia Sabalevska. Good evening, and I am a um, uh, community engagement liaison representing Russian-speaking community. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'm uh, here to ask you to support and find uh, more money <laughs> and funds for a second mobile playground van for East Portland. The second van was part of the 2017-18 uh, uh, cut recommendations. The result is that for all East Portland, there was just one van with a once a week visit schedule for PPR. Uh, there is no proposal to restore the second van for East Portland in the current budget cycle. Uh, with 40% of the school age children lived in East Portland, providing summer services that promote a healthy lifestyle and support community building is essential, all sites selected in East Portland um, qualify for free lunches with more than 50% of the children meeting the financial guidelines for free and reduced lunches. Further of the uh, total summer free for all cons concerts and movies provide throughout the city. East Portland with 28% of the population had just five movies and three concerts. It's mean 11% of total. Uh, yes, we have two new developed uh, wonderful uh, parks, but there are also at least 19 other uh, sites that are not uh, in, um, developed. And most children live in that close to 19 undeveloped uh, sizes, uh, um, parks. A mobile playground van is one way of providing needed services to our future generations while encouraging community building. The cost of another mobile van is just 25000 and we uh, ask you to support find this money uh, for this second van mobile playground. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. My name is Jason Epton. I'm here to speak on behalf of parks maintaining and continuing to maintain the fountains. Uh, 
the main reasons for parks to continue maintaining fountains is we have a dedicated crew that is highly trained and focused in just maintenance of parks fountains. Uh, that is all we do. And we don't get called off for emergencies to go fix other things. Our number one priority is the maintenance and daily operation of the fountains. The parks has made a substantial investment when taking over the fountains from the Water Bureau uh, with vehicles, tools, technology such as our SCADA system and the training of our four person crew. Uh, the location of these interactive and decorative fountains are in our parks. So public perception of the fountains is they are a park asset. When there is a complaint about our fountains, they call the Parks Bureau to let them know. When there's a problem with the fountains, we call the Parks Bureau to let them know. As of right now, our fountains crew is paired up with our pools crew because keeping like with like makes sense. Our interactive fountains are maintained to a standard of pool qualities. So we maintain pH, free chlorine, we monitor water temperature and water levels and we're able to uh, back each other, each work unit up from fountains to pools. And the last reason why I think fountains should stay with parks is because we want them. Parks is happy to do it, we love to do it, and we're passionate about what we do. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys Appreciate for your time. You. Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll now have two uh, representatives from CARE, uh, not COPS come up and speak, as well as one representative from the Children's Museum, and then we'll continue the lottery. <laughs> and, and a couple of, um, a couple of others as well. Uh, good evening, council members and mayor. Uh, my name is Maria Boyer. I'm a teacher in the Portland and Beaverton Public School Districts. Um, and I am with the Care Not Cops uh, Mental Health Care Not Police and Community Coalition. Um, we're back again for the second year in a row uh, to demand an immediate reduction in the taxpayer-funded Portland Police Bureau budget, uh, not the proposed increase of nearly $13 million. Mm. Last year, the PPB was allocated almost $217 million, yet are asking for $13 million in addition to that figure. And Portland is currently facing economic and social crises related to social services, as we've been hearing. There are increasing numbers of houseless people, Portlanders losing their homes, their jobs, their health care, while the PPB currently spends nearly $600,000 every day. Community and neighborhood safety cannot be achieved with increased policing. This funding must be invested in community programs such as increased housing, transformative justice models, and education. We call for an immediate freeze on new PBB hires instead of the nearly 100 new positions proposed. Mm. The police budget proposes funding 93 more full-time armed and active police positions, including 21 community police. We need life-affirming and skilled staffing positions in other programs and city infrastructure, not more police officers. The budget calls for 21 new community police who will be charged with more street patrols, broken windows policing, and local surveillance. Community policing targets working class neighborhoods and communities of color, prioritizes areas of active gentrification, preferences protecting property over preventing individual harm, and brings more police into our communities, increasing targeting of people of color. Police will never be adequate or appropriate mental health responders, never. The budget requests an additional $1.5 million for service coordination and it increases both police and clinician positions under the Portland Police Bureau for provision of substance use and mental health services. The framework for these services is based in punitive and coercive measures rather than user-centered, voluntary, and supportive services. This funding must be invested directly into community-based services, not contingent on police interaction. We demand that the City Council invest in life-affirming response to mental health crises by building up community-based and peer-led services and resources. Direct funds to people and organizations that have existing relationships with targeted or vulnerable populations, such as those who work with houseless people to find support, resources, and housing. With adequate resources, people who are connected with their existing networks and communities can provide long-term resources and support. Fund mental health advocates with experience in providing trauma-informed support which would immensely benefit survivors of trauma experiencing mental health emergencies, fund those individuals and organizations that connect people with care and support following a mental health emergency rather than increase policing, which re-traumatizes and criminalizes people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Pagan and I'm with Don't Shoot Portland and we're out here today supporting critical resistance and care not cops. 
We've been protesting in the streets not just against police murder, against people like Quanis Hayes, a black teenager who was killed by Portland police, Aaron Campbell, Kendra James, and the list goes on and on. These officers have not been brought to justice. Right now, the city of Oakland is in uh, complete mayhem right now because people cannot get justice and they continue to do what it is that they've always done, which is to target black and brown communities, especially poor ones. And when Maria just said that the purpose of community policing is to go into poor neighborhoods of black and brown people to humiliate them, to let them know just how low of a rung they are in society, that is what they do. That is synonymous with surveillance and what we all know as broken windows policing. That is the same thing, and please don't think that by calling it a different name that we are going to be fooled. No, Don't Shoot Portland does not show up in the streets every time the police abuse and kill people, but we're talking about people who are not being served. You said yourself that the reason that you can't uh, help the people that are at places like the self-managed village of hope is because you tell homeless people that there are services in this city that they can go to in order to get what they need when we know that they're underfunded but who never has to be here you have all of these community members that are here right now that are fighting over scraps but you have the democratic socialists of america who are talking about taxing the rich the people who never have to come to this table and beg for scraps are the police they always get what they need so i hope Thanks, everyone. So to anybody that's here, so to anybody that's here right now that's wondering why it is that their programs are not getting funded, it is because we have an inflated police budget. And to anyone here that has never had a bad run-in with the cops, or if you have a police officer that's in your family, I would say, very good, I'm not attacking them, and we're not attacking them. We are Thank talking you. about outcomes. Is... No. The outcomes of policing is racist and targets people who are already vulnerable, and we Thank you. do not plan to let it persist. Thank you. Okay, everyone, please, we want to get through as many public comments as possible. So please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. I'm Ruth Shelley from Portland Children's Museum, here with a group of boarded staff representing the 300,000 children and families that we serve every year who we hope are going to bed right now. Three weeks ago, I sat before you to express our gratitude for the museum's long and successful partnership with the city, which dates back to 1946. When we became a private nonprofit in 2001, the city offered a generous lease that included utility payments. Thank you. We truly could not operate without this support. As you know, that lease will expire in 13 years, and you have asked us to find a new location. Last month, I asked that the city please continue to support us as we transition to a new home. Imagine our dismay when we learned that proposed budget cuts to parks included the museum paying $120,000 per year for utilities. This would be a direct violation of our lease agreement, the foundation of our budget for 17 years. Now, more than ever, Portland Children's Museum needs the city's support, not cuts, to build its capacity for a new location. With our break-even budget, to suddenly absorb $120,000 each year without warning would have dire consequences. To cover this expense, we would need to either increase our admission price by 14%, almost $50 for a family of four, this is beyond most families' budget. Or, to stay affordable, we would need to lay off at least three employees, meaning that not only people lose their jobs, but also that the museum would be forced to eliminate free nights, our low sensory access play evenings for children with disabilities, our outreach to distant communities, and or to close one day a week. Such cuts would also impact our ability to generate revenue, further compounding the burden. Our lease is a promise. Please keep that promise of partnership and let us increase, not diminish, our service to the children and families of Portland. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So we have a few um, folks here ready to testify and I'm gonna call off the remaining raffle numbers. Um, we're gonna get through as many of these as we can before our 
end time of 825 for public testimony. So the numbers are 437 708 676 731 433 704 and 807. And remember that if you didn't get a chance to testify, we do have comment forms out on the front table. You probably got one as you walked in, so we encourage you to submit those. Good Hi, evening. my name is Sariye Shenasi. I'm an immigrant from Iran and a cancer survivor. When I call Elder in Action, I can't speak English well because, but I must tell you what Elder in Action did for me. When I called Elders in Action, I was totally hopeless because Social Security cut my benefits uh, to $152 only. And uh, when I called Elders in Action, they called, back called me the um, other day tomorrow after that, and um, tirelessly and selflessly continue to help me for four and five months. They connect for senator's office, and finally, I get my total benefits from social security. Uh, I am so hopeful now because I can afford my life and because of that the kind people there is I am a volunteer here and try to do one of thousands things that they did for me I can do and I beg you don't cut their budget because if you do, did it, do it, you cut our hopes. I, we haven't other hopes. We haven't other helps here. Just like me. The people like me doesn't have any hopes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Hi, I'm Sarah with the Portland National Lawyers Guild, the NLG, and we strongly support the investment in community services rather than policing and the goal of taking away police from mental health responses. We object to the recommendations of the police and city to increase funding for the armed sworn officers. We urge council to listen to those who have direct experience with police violence and are most impacted by this proposed budget. The Bureau's 2018-19 budget request is $12.7 million increase from last year, which is approximately 90 positions. In council's work sessions, the city's budget author, office recommend, recommended approximately 50 new hires, a phased in approach so that hits to the budget don't happen all at once. However, a slow creep of armed law enforcement only leads to a slow creep, ah, well, yes, of, <laughs> um, of fear and violence in our communities. This is true whether funding can be armed law enforcement who provide that the Bureau calls for core services of patrolling and emergency responses or whether it be for quoted community policing. We are deeply concerned about the mismatch between the request of the evidence of police effectiveness. There is no strong evidence, for instance, that emergency response by armed police officers actually prevent harm, yet we all know well too well how late that gun violence by police officers have harmed the lives of many, many people in our communities and across the nation. We are also deeply concerned about the Bureau's use of the 21st century policing, community policing, livability, quote, without clear definitions as to how these terms are used and distinguished from broken windows policing, which focused on poverty crimes enforcement, disproportionately criminalizes low-income communities and communities of color. The mayor specifically named increasing public safety and police accountability as one of the top five priorities to achieve through this year's citywide budget. We believe that true safety and well-being will be accomplished not by increased funding for more armed police officers, but by true investing in our community. Um, 
through housing, food security, health care, mental health care, drug and alcohol treatment, education, and livable wage jobs. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Wheeler and members of the council. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you about the budget. Uh, my name is Jeff Anderson. I'm executive director of the Portland Parks Foundation. Uh, the foundation was created by the city in 2001 as Portland's chief private fundraising partner for parks. Portland Parks Foundation shares the concern of many folks here tonight uh, about the ongoing general fund uh, cuts for PPNR in the proposed budget. Uh, public parks, and that includes community centers, are very likely our most popular city service. 86% uh, of Portlanders still rate their parks as good or excellent, and more than 9 out of 10 residents use parks, uh, at least on an annual basis. Parks advance community wealth, community health, and community culture. They're not an expendable amenity. They're as essential as any other service, supported by city budget dollars. Yet, the city budget office's uh, recommended cuts are disproportionately high, and in fact, it looks like 40% of all the cuts they're recommending are targeting our parks. Parks are integral to our core character as a city. Um, they host major festivals, diverse cultural events and celebrations, and a variety of events promoting local enterprise. Uh, a recent study estimates the economic impact of local parks in Oregon at 1.9 billion dollars and over 17,000 jobs and Portland has a big slice of that pie in Oregon. Portlanders routinely give some 470,000 hours a year to volunteering in the parks, an annual value of 5.5 million dollars or more. The City of Portland's budget should signal appreciation for that contribution and should reinforce, not undermine, the efforts of volunteers. In fact, the city should be looking for every additional opportunity to leverage goodwill and private resources that have already contributed so much to the parks around Portland. So in closing, now I would urge you to support public parks the way Portland's public wants you to and invest in what makes Portland not only livable but exceptional. And the Portland Parks Foundation stands ready to help. So thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, good evening. Good evening. My name is Emily Goldenfields. I am a mother to a daughter over there actually sitting on her teacher's lap and um, co-chair of the Portland Democratic Socialists of America. And I'm here because Mayor Wheeler has proposed citywide budget cuts of $4.5 million. And among the Bureau's proposed cuts is to close down the community center where my daughter is attending preschool for the second year. The city has already defunded the community preschools as of fall of 2018, and claims that they must be, quote, self-sustaining. Our community preschool program has taught my daughter social skills, early literacy, fine motor skills, and has allowed her to flourish and be kindergarten ready. I think many of us are surprised when we hear that the city needs to cut its budget. Just looking around, we see incredible, unprecedented wealth. We see luxury condos popping up on practically every other block, skyrocketing housing prices. Cuts just don't make sense, especially when so many residents are struggling to just live here. But we don't have to settle for cuts. For example, if we implemented a progressive city income tax beginning at a modest 2% for individuals with incomes over 250,000 or 500,000 for joint filers, and progressively increase to 8%, for individuals earning a million dollars a year or jointly two million, the city could generate $114 million a year. What could we do with $114 million a year? Well, under current city leadership, our community preschools and community, pr and community centers are on the chopping block. What if rather than defunding preschool and closing centers, we expanded them? What if we provided free high quality pre-K to every child in Portland? Thank you, everyone. Seattle does it. San Francisco does it. New York City does it. Denver does it. Washington, D.C. and Boston do it. Why stop at pre-K? We can have transportation, housing. The sky is the limit. We need bold leadership, and we need to tax the rich and fund our city. Thank you all. Please do sit down. Go ahead, sir. 
Uh, Mayor, commissioners, my name is Karanja Cruz. I'm a Portland native. I'm a professional teacher by trade, uh, taught elementary school for 13 years. I recently transitioned, uh, now I'm an entrepreneur, and I took out all of my retirement to start a cannabis retail business. I wanna talk about the reallocation of tax dollars. Um, I noticed that the police had a huge chunk of that cannabis tax dollars, and I wanna talk about, uh, have a conversation with you all about the reallocation maybe towards, maybe that funding go towards education, uh, maybe go towards supporting uh, minority-owned businesses. I believe, uh, Commissioner Udaley, you have a, a $1.2 million proposal. I'm suggesting that we increase that amount um, and that we put more towards education as well. Um, that's all I have. Never been to a public testimony before, and um, hopefully I can have a conversation with you all. Thank you. Appreciate nice it. Nice work. So we'll have these three come up. So we've asked our last three speakers to try to limit their comments to one minute each uh, so that we can get three more in before the end. You know, I, I, think, we, I think we can stay a couple of minutes and give, give them To give them each two? Yeah, Perfect, sure. thank you. At least I, I, oh, believe me, you don't want me to talk longer good. than a minute, okay? <laughs> thank you. My name's Kitsy Brown Mahoney. I'm from the Woodstock neighborhood. Um, I've been a, uh, I've lived down the street from Woodstock Community Center for 43 years. I wrote this for you. I am the Woodstock Community Center. I am old, but I am tough. I am proud to stand before you. I am proud, but I am gruff. I am the Woodstock Community Center. I stand with other endangered centers. I struggle to not be cut from the budget as if we were ungrateful renters. I am the Woodstock Community Center, where many events take place. I am happy to share my roster. I'm proud to be in your face. I am the Woodstock Community Center. I have fought to stay open for years. I understand the budget process. I have seen our people in tears. I am the Woodstock Community Center. Selwood, Hillside, and Fulton are in our same boat. We have the safe place and places and programs to keep our city afloat. I am the Woodstock Community Center, rallying to stay alive one more time. We submitted our petitions and our postcards representing thousands added to this rhyme. I am the Woodstock Community Center, supporting many, young and old. Do not disservice our communities. The city appreciates us, really, or at least that is what we are told. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners and mayor. Uh, I'm Jessica Getman, I'm board chair of the Portland Children's Museum, and I just wanna quickly underscore Ruth Shelley's comments. Uh, to not have the Children's Museum be required to pay the $120,000 of utility costs. As board chair and as a board member, I am constantly in awe of how the Children's Museum contributes to our community. Yearly, we, we have over 300,000 children and families that come visit. On a daily basis, we have 125 students from preschool uh, up to fifth grade that attend the Opal School. And we have thousands of, of teachers that access our uh, academia and, and resources online to further their education. But what really moves me uh, more than anything is the effort that the board and the staff continuously has in advancing uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in our community here. A couple of examples would be um, any family that's on public assistance can get into the Children's Museum for a dollar or could have an annual membership for only $15. Just this past Saturday, children at the museum were fitted for $6 bike helmets and then they uh, tried out a safety course while, blood, while the adults gave blood at a blood mobile in the parking lot. And this coming Friday, uh, OHSU dental students will be on hand for our first free Friday where they're going to offer complimentary dental screenings. Oh, that's great. So as you can see, we're more than just a children's museum. We are a place in this community, but as a board member, I also know uh, it is quite hard to balance our budget uh, every year, especially as expenses increase. And if we were forced to pay the utilities, then we would have to cut some of these resources that we provide the community. Thank you. Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you all. 
My name is Dee White. I will be commenting on the Water Bureau budget tonight. I watched the Water Bureau's budget work session last Thursday and again on Friday. Thank you to Citizen Budget Advisors Ms. Otero Serrano and Mr. Dozono for your thoughtful and point direct questions. Mrs. Otero Serrano, who is from Puerto Rico, commented to the Water Bureau, the disaster in Puerto Rico was not the hurricane. The disaster was in our water infrastructure. She asked, what, how long will it take the Water Bureau to become resilient to the inevitable earthquake? The Water Bureau replied, 40 to 50 years. They say the boogaboos are the pipes. They say the conduits are very old and in need of replacement. They say they are planning on starting the budgeting process for this pipe and conduit capital improvement project in the next few years. This industry-driven policy and budgeting of the Water Bureau has resulted in a public health crisis in Portland that has nothing to do with cryptosporidium and a $500 million filtration plant and everything to do with the neurotoxin lead filthy, corroded pipes a poorly and a poorly maintained distribution system ill-equipped to handle a seismic emergency. The first priority of the Water Bureau should be getting the lead out. We have the highest lead of any large water utility in the U.S. despite having a year and a half to follow the EPA and OHA's directive 2016 to immediately reduce the lead in our water. It remains at dangerous levels throughout the city and zero officials in our city, county, or state government seem to be too worried about it given their bizarre silence. I'm going to repeat what I said. The budget and policy of the Water Bureau has resulted in a public health crisis in Portland that has nothing to do with the non-issue of cryptosporidium and a $500 million filtration plant and everything to do with the neurotoxin lead, filthy corroded pipes, and uh, thank you. <laughs> One more speaker that the mayor has agreed to hear that's representing a group that's here. I want to remind you all to fill out your forms if you want written comment. The council has agreed that they will make sure that all of that gets reviewed. Thank you. Thank you for accommodating me. Thank you for being here. Yeah. My name is Mata Zapeda. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Switchboard. I'm also the board president of Accelerate. Accelerate is a program that we created last year thanks to the council's support to help to support women entrepreneurs. And this year we are asking for you to consider a $275,000 one-time allocation for the Small Business Growth Program, which supports both Accelerate and PSU, PSU's program as well. Women start businesses at five times the rate of men. They are one-third of the country's business owners and women of color are the fastest growing sector of entrepreneurs. We started Accelerate to support this community with education and financing and to fuel economic growth in Oregon. It is estimated that investing $475 billion in women will create $4 trillion in GDP. In Portland, that translates to 13% growth of GDP. And in the years since we have started Accelerate, we have supported over 22 women entrepreneurs and we anticipate supporting another 50 this year. They are across sectors like the ones that you heard from in automotive, in technology, beauty, healthcare, food, and beverage. And we have leveraged those dollars most importantly. With private support, we have more than tripled the dollars that were originally granted. With your support, we will continue this program. It's critical to create ecosystems like this and to support women entrepreneurs on their own terms by providing access to, to programs like this that um, accommodate their needs around childcare, around supporting their families, around non-traditional work programs. And so we are asking for your support in continuing this program this year. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you everyone for your comments and for your patience with the process and your civility. Um, and thank you to the city council. And, and before we have some closing remarks from the mayor, I do wanna remind you that there are two more events coming up. Um, April 17th, there will be an event just like this one at Roosevelt High School at 6.30. And there will also be a budget committee hearing on May 10th 
from 6 until 8.30 um, at Portland City Hall to listen to public testimony. So there are two more opportunities to provide your comments. So uh, briefly, there, there's something that is on my mind and I can't really articulate it yet, but a lot of you have mentioned it and I want you to know I've heard it and I'm going to reflect on it and I'm going to see what changes we can make for next time. And what I'm hearing is there's a lot of people who come year after year to testify on behalf of the same programs that aren't actually ever reduced. Um, so I'm going to think about how if I support a program, we can give that program space so that people don't feel like they have to come and uh, do this every year. So that's sort of thing number one. Uh, I've spoken enough. I want to give my colleagues some room here to, to share their thoughts. I just want to say thank you. Again, uh, I appreciate everybody's being here tonight. I know you're all busy. You have many things you could be doing. Uh, and I think one of the great things about this city is people show up. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Udaley, if, if you wanted to say anything. Well, thanks again, everyone, for coming. I kept a tally of everyone's, oh, I'm, okay, that wasn't me, uh, comments to get a sense of what people in the room were feeling. And um, I share your concerns and frustrations. This is a trying process. And it sometimes feels like we're really not getting to, we're not getting to what we need to get to in these budget cuts. And um, I'm sorry for that. And I'm not opposed to taxing the rich. However, <laughs> we may be precluded from uh, establishing a city tax at the state level. Okay, well, we'll talk later. Sorry, I'm exhausted, which is why I'm talking so slowly, and I'm gonna pass it off to Commissioner Fritz now. Thank you. Well, I'm angry. I'm not exhausted, I'm angry, and I'm, I'm angry with being in charge of Portland Parks and Recreation for now five years, and I want to thank every single person who came out here tonight, because in, with all due respect, Mayor, if you take these people's concerns off the table. Everything in Portland Parks and Recreation is important to somebody. It's about pro providing services and it's about making our city livable, as Jeff Anderson said. And I want uh, Jason from the water, from Parks, who is the, uh, takes care of the fountains. You have been here every single year that I've been here, having to defend your job. And, and just thank you. And thank you to Laborers 483 for all the work you do. Part of the reason that Parks needs more money is because we're finally paying our workers, some of them, most of them, $15 an hour. Whereas before, like the preschool program was being funded basically on the backs of the workers. And so now, last year, the council said preschool has to make its own way. We have a budget request in for $80,000 to, to provide uh, scholarships for that. I don't, I, this is my 10th year on the council. I don't believe we can continue to cut and cut and cut. And we cut during the recession every year asking for the exercise of cuts is so painful to the people whose services are being cut, to the people whose jobs are being cut. And to me, as, as somebody who is elected to try to provide basic services to everybody rather than cut them. And so I believe strongly that we need to look at new revenue this year. And again, I just want to thank you all for coming out. Um, you make me really proud to be your commissioner. How many people here signed up to testify and did not get a chance to testify. So, Mayor, if we're gonna have another hearing, I think we should figure out a system so that the people that were here tonight and didn't get to testify are first in the queue for the next hearing. And I think, I think we can use the honor system when we do it, but I would recommend that the next forum, someone who was here tonight and didn't get to testify should go first in the queue so they get, they get to testify at, at the next hearing. Otherwise, we're just wearing people out. So uh, I am. So I, I am certain. 
I'm certainly happy to add additional forums. I've got nothing but time. I want to make sure I get it right. <laughs> I've got until the end of April, uh, and then you will see my first cut at the budget. Uh, some people said I'd made my mind up. I want to be very clear. Uh, I have not made my mind up, and I will not make my mind up until probably about three minutes before I present uh, the proposed budget to the city council. So this is not just a theoretical exercise for me. Public input matters. I want to hear what people are thinking. And if people want to come and do an additional forum or an additional two forums, I'm game. I think if people were here tonight and didn't get to testify, they should go first in the queue. And it's late, so thank you all for your time and for joining us tonight and for, I think, a very productive hearing. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.